So I'll jump in here. I am Paul Nemechek, uh, Associate Professor of Sociology here. I started working for Spring Arbor 36 years ago. Uh, and I'm director of SAU Guatemala, our program, uh, semester abroad program there. And I, we have, raise your hand if you've been to Guatemala. Yeah, we have a <laughs> <laughs> and my friend uh, Juan Carlos Martinez Lopez is here, the director of La Union Central and Vista. <laughs> um, if I seem a little disoriented, it's only because I am. Uh, we left Guatemala at 2.30 yesterday afternoon, left the land of eternal spring, and pulled into uh, Spring Arbor at 1.30 this morning. So bear with me. Uh, my topic, I endow us and them in the Imago Dei, or image of God. And our, our main topic of the focus series is what does it mean to be human? And there are different ways we can ask that question. One is just classification. Uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, if you took biology. Uh, but we'll ask some sociological and theological questions. And there's two different ways I want to approach this. Um, one is kind of the classification. What, how are humans similar? different than other species, how are we similar uh, to each other, but then what are the obligations? What does it mean to be human in terms of my obligations? Ethical, philosophical, theological questions. Just quickly, in terms of classification, if you go far enough up in the classification scheme, we have things in common with monarch butterflies. And as you get further and further down, I read somewhere, uh, Chris Newhouse is here, so he can answer this question. Someone said that uh, male humans have more in common with male chimpanzees than female humans. Is that uh, in terms of DNA? Yeah. I think it's probably a woman that said that. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we are part of the animal kingdom. Um, and one of the questions that comes up in discussions like this, in what ways are we similar to other species? How are we different than other species? And where we are different, is this a di difference of degree or a difference of kind? And one of my colleagues that some of you will remember from a long time ago, Mike Boyven, we used to get into this argument all the time where he's, when we talk about language in particular, he'd point out that Coco the Gorilla could sign 500 words and things like that. And I said, if you can get Coco the Gorilla to give me a 500-word theme on Marx's concept of dialectical materialism, we'll talk. <laughs> but until then, I see it as a difference of kind. So things have changed somewhat, and we're still discovering ways in which we have similarities with other species. And you may have seen this short little video that has to do with, um, I've always argued that there are abstract concepts like justice that separate us from other species. Let's see if this pulls up OK. Waiting for the internet here. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys. And I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees. Um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but <laughs> cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. 
And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> All that to say, we're still figuring out ways the things we have in common with other species, and there may be more things there than we thought in the past. Karl Marx, when he talked about uh, the ways in which humans are different, talked about species essence or species being, and he talked more about things like the human capacity for self-consciousness. Mark Twain once said, humans are the only animals that blush or need to. Uh, <laughs> and that was kind of his sense of humor about our self-consciousness. Uh, abstract thought and creativity, and the creativity is one of the things that Marx focused on. He said, a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells, but what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. And so that capacity for creativity, abstract thought, Self-consciousness may be one of the things that separates us from other species. Alfred Schutz uh, wrote about four life worlds that humans occupy, and he spent most of his time on the difference between what he called Mitwelt and Umwelt. Four life worlds, the first three are those whom I am not directly perceiving, and what he called Thorwelt is our predecessors. And so our predecessors may affect us in different ways. What they did may have an impact on us, but it doesn't directly, we don't have direct perception of them. Fogelbelt is what he used for our successors, those who come after, and we may have some sense of taking them into consideration. Mitvelt are our contemporaries, uh, but those who are, we're not in direct contact with. So we're aware of them. Uh, and so I may be aware of somebody somewhere else, but never have direct perception, direct contact. He put more emphasis on Umwelt. Consociates are those who share with me a community of space and a community of time. And he, most of his writing is on the difference between Umwelt and Mitwelt, those who are somewhere else that I might be aware of, but not directly perceiving or perceived by. And this will come back when we talk about a few other uh, thinkers, including uh, this guy, Georg Zimmel, is one of the, uh, some people say there are the big three in sociology, and the big three would be Mark Sturkheim and Weber. Some include Georg Zimmel. I think that makes him the Ringo star of sociology <laughs> or something like that. It's not in the same category as the other three. But he, his work was often in an area called social geometry. And he has a really interesting article called The Stranger. And what he talks about is the stranger is one who is neither too distant or too close. If they're too distant, they're not part of our frame of reference. If they're too close, they're no longer a stranger. And so someone somewhere in between. And this puts them somewhere between uh, Schutz's categories of Umwelt and Mitwelt. We perceive them but not in that sense of immediacy. They're a stranger. Uh, and part of what I want to talk about is how strangers become other uh, and, and what that implies in terms of social obligation. Martin Buber has a, his most famous work is a Jewish theologian, I and Thou, and he talks about I-Thou relations in contrast to I-It relations. I-it relations treat the other as object. And sometimes it may not be readily apparent when that's happening. When I go through the drive through at McDonald's, for example, welcome to McDonald's and all of the language of familiarity and relationship, but I'm an object to them and they to me. Does that make sense? 
I mean, if you don't believe me, next time you go through McDonald's, ask how their family members are and try to engage them in conversation about their hobbies and things like that, because that's not the nature of the relationship. No matter how much we dress it up, we're pretty much objects to each other. And uh, Buber contrasts that to I-thou relationships where there's more of a sense of intimacy, connectedness, and two quotes from his book, I-thou relations, can only be spoken with the whole of one's being. I, it, can never be spoken with the whole of one's being. And so this difference between treating the other as, to use Buber's term, thou, is for him a sacred space. It's a sacred relationship and moves someone out of being an object. They're no longer an it. They're a thou in, in Buber's terms. So if we move to theology for a minute, the Imago Dei is the image of God. Humans are created in the image of God. Um, and we could talk at length about what that means. Does it mean only that humans have a soul? Does it mean that humans are different from other species in significant ways? Uh, and so forth. And what I want to talk about theologically is the problem of otherness. That is, when we define someone not as I thou relationships, but when they become an it, when they become other. And this is what I mean in the title when I talk about us and them. Uh, the Mishnah, some of the early Jewish writings from the first and second century, have what were called purity codes or purity maps. And time, space, and people were categorized in terms of which was most holy. For example, Israel was holier than any other nation. And within Israel, Judea was holier. And then within Judea, Jerusalem. Within Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And of course, you get into the Temple. And then the Holy of Holies, the most sacred space in all of Israel, in all of the world, according to the, the Jewish traditions. Similarly, with time, uh, the Sabbath, the most holy of all. But then other sacred days kind of move out from there. Uh, and I'll talk in a minute about one of the purity maps. The whole problem of otherness Jesus encounters throughout his ministry. Luke 4, you may remember, is when he gives what we might call his inaugural sermon. Uh, he reads from Isaiah 61 and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to break good news to the poor, set up liberty to the captives, restore sight to the blind, liberate the oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the acceptable year of the Lord, of course, is a metaphor for the year of Jubilee. And he's saying this in Galilee, an area that's mostly poor peasant sharecroppers. People have been deprived of their land and so forth. So the audience is really cheering him on. Jesus goes on to tell about two times when God healed Gentiles and they try to throw him over a cliff. And so we like it when you did the first part. That whole second thing when you're talking about the others, we don't even like so much. Uh, and this is something Jesus encounters throughout his ministry. Galatians 3.28 is Paul is referring to a tradition of the head of the Hebrew household. The head of the Hebrew household in the, would get up in the morning and say a traditional prayer, which was, I thank God, because he hasn't made me a Jew, or hasn't made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And in Galatians 3.28, Paul writes, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, uh, male nor female. Well, in Christ there isn't, but in the world there is. Uh, race, class, and gender are three of the ways that sociologists talk about stratification of societies and the ways in which we define the other as other. This is one of the examples of one of the purity maps uh, from the Mishnah. The most holy of all priests and then Levites, Israelites, converts, freed slaves, disqualified priests, the teens, the temple slaves, bastards, eunuchs, those with damaged testicles, and those without a penis which I think would be most of the people at Spring Arbor University. Uh, and so they have this hierarchy of who's more holy and who's more pure and who is other. And a good part of Jesus' ministry, you remember he was criticized for hanging out with those people, whether it's tax collectors or people who are drinking or Gentiles and so forth. Uh, and so the idea of purity maps or otherness is hardly new. But what we want to think about is what's that look like in our contemporary society? Who do we define as other? And what are our social obligations to those who are defined as other? 
And some of the ways in which we define people, certainly race and ethnicity, social class, gender and gender identity, age, nationality, sexual orientation, ideology, religion. Um, we could probably go on and on with the different ways in which we define people as other. Uh, they're not us, they're them kind of thing. I want to talk, I'll come back to this, I'll make these points as I go through. My first awareness of the implications of otherness comes, this is from the Chicago Tribune. Sorry about the picture, uh, but it's from the Chicago Tribune archives. And I'll just read it as it's written here. Negro children were greeted by hostile crowds when they arrived at Locke Elementary School during the first day of busing on March 12, 1968. Um, a few days later, this is from a local newspaper, sixth day at Locke. It was Monday morning as the group of 50 students from Austin Spencer School came to attend classes at Montclair's Locke School. And this is 1968 in Chicago, and they're integrating the school through busing. Uh, the Brown versus Board of Education ruling was in 1954. 14 years later in the North, they're still working on trying to integrate the schools. And I know this, because that's me right there. Uh, and I was captain of the safety patrol, and so the, I was with the police helping the kids get off the bus. And the first day of this event, Hostile parents are behind my back, screaming racial epithets at the kids. Two women were arrested when they threw eggs at the bus that were bringing children to the school. Uh, and throughout, there were significant protests during this period of busing. Uh, white parents organized the boycott. There's a picture of my younger brother in a classroom that normally held 25, and he's one of two kids in school that day because the white parents are boycotting the school. And for me, 13 years old at the time, I'm trying to figure out what's what is all the fuss about? What is it about the otherness of these kids getting off the bus that's so threatening uh, and so harmful or something like that? Why does it create such fear uh, in people? Three weeks, a little less than three weeks after this event, this was the headline. Um, and so again, someone who was trying to overcome the consequences of otherness, who was assassinated, uh, and this is what Chicago looked like then. Uh, my father's church was in the Austin community, uh, and this is a picture of the Austin community and the, the troops that were patrolling the street because of the riots following King's assassination. This is another picture of the Austin community, buildings burned uh, and so forth, um, again in reaction to all of this. My father, the next year, uh, left the pastorate he was pastoring a church that was mostly Swedish-speaking Finns, first and second generation immigrants from Finland. And they came to him, and, and the Austin community at that time was becoming more African-American and Latino. And the members of the church came to him and said, we don't want those people attending our church. And my father was not. Uh, after that event, just two months after, that's when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, two months after that, this is the Democratic Convention in Chicago. That's not how Democrats always behave. <laughs> but there were lots of, uh, sometimes, uh, Will Rogers once said, I'm not a member of any organized party, I'm a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hippies and yippies, which stood for youth in politics and protesting the war in Vietnam, and so the Chicago police were out in force, uh, kind of, doing pretty brutal crowd control by most measures. Uh, and so the next year I started high school, or the next month, with eyes wide open. <laughs> <laughs> More or less. Uh, but that was, I, I didn't realize until much later, but that was the beginning of my journey towards being a sociologist. Because I'm trying to make sense of a world going mad at that point, at least the world I knew looked completely crazy at that point. Uh, but a lot of questions about how we define others as other, as them, and what that means for our ethics. Um, this is Jackson Prison. I was going to send this postcard to my mother-in-law, but that forbade me from doing that. <laughs> uh, this is up there because my first job for Spring Arbor University 36 years ago 
was as coordinator of a prison program we had at Jackson Prison. At the, our peak, we had about 350 students taking classes um, in the prison system, the same classes students on campus would take. And I had an office, uh, well, right, let's see if I can use the pointer here. My office was right about there inside the prison and I shared that office with five inmates who did the typing and filing for me, three of whom were in for homicide. And I took the job not because I had this deep passion for prison issues, but I was working at Spring Arbor Industries, a pallet factory across the street here, and I would have taken any job that wasn't that job uh, <laughs> at that point. Uh, but my, I think my passion for prison issues came out of that experience. Um, before the day I, my contract with Spring Arbor started was July 1st, 1979. And that same day, I was ordained in the church I was co-pastoring in downtown Jackson. Bev and I were living in a predominantly African-American community, and our church was an interracial church. Uh, so that was the day of my ordination service. And I decided I would start work the next day. And I said, my commitment is to see every person who walks through the door as a human being created in the image of God, first and foremost. And then other things we'll deal with later kind of thing. And so that was my uh, kind of initiation into prison stuff. That's me on the, your left there. The three women in the middle were the <coughs> campus staff and the men on the end were the two of us who had the office at the prison uh, and would schedule classes and all of that kind of stuff. About that same time, after about two years, I taught my first class ever, my first college class, was Core 400 at Jackson Prison. And as part of the class, I showed the movie The Elephant Man. Have any of you seen the movie The Elephant Man? A powerful movie about John Merrick, who has really um, serious, serious problems. When we first meet him in the movie, he's a sideshow freak in a circus uh, and being grossly abused. Dr. Treves takes him in, discovers that he's a gentle soul, has memorized the 23rd Psalm and other things. But there's one spot in the movie where he's being pursued by a crowd and he wears a bag over his head to not scare people because he has extreme tumors and distortion in uh, the spine and so forth. And at one point, they corner him and he takes off the bag and he says, I'm not an animal, I'm not an elephant, I am a human being. My students in the prison, four guys, tears rolling down my cheeks. At that point, um, and I realized it's because they identify with that sense of I'm not an animal. They live in cages, they're transported in chains, they talk about feeding time uh, in the prison, and there's all kinds of language of animalization for the inmates. Now again, this is in the maximum security section of the prison, so these guys are there for things other than skipping church. Uh, I mean, pretty serious offenses, but four of them that struck such a chord that they had tears rolling down their cheeks. And so it was another chance for me to say, what, is, what are the implications of this in terms of otherness? What happens when we define people as other in terms of their self-concept, in terms of uh, other kinds of things? These are, this is when I have six clerks working for me. Three of these guys are in for, were in for homicide. Um, the two in the middle had killed their wife's lovers, very similar circumstances that landed them uh, in prison. Uh, Chung, the man in the middle on the top, uh, came to stay with us for a couple of days after he got out of prison. Wonderful guy who, in worst possible circumstances, committed a heinous crime. But he's someone who committed murder, not a murderer, if that makes sense. That is, the action doesn't define the totality of his being. Uh, this seems like an odd transition here. Some of you may recognize this. I posted this on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, that's the upper left is Buffalo, uh, when it got hit pretty hard. The lower left is Grand Rapids, and that's my front courtyard. Uh, one of these is not like the other. And I put this up here to transition to talking a little bit about Guatemala. Guatemala is a beautiful country, fifth highest in the world in biodiversity, a great deal of cultural diversity, 21 different Mayan languages spoken in Guatemala. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful country. And so the students who are here, in Guatemala, I often say, if you leave here and you haven't seen the beauty of Guatemala, you haven't seen Guatemala. But at the same time, if you leave Guatemala without having seen the pain, 
and the suffering that's Guatemala's history, you haven't seen Guatemala. And so the struggle is to do both and to hold them together. What the UN Human Rights Commission declared as a genocide, two, the civil war from 1960 to 1996. I actually don't like that term. I'm not sure any war has ever been civil. <laughs> but uh, it, they talk about it as the armed conflict or la violencia. Some of the reactions against the concept of civil war is that very unequal in terms of the two sides. 93% of those killed were killed by the military in Guatemala. So it's not as if it was kind of two equal sides warring. But a total of 200,000 people killed, 50,000 were disappeared, 1 million displaced. And I was trying to put that in perspective, because in a country like ours, 200,000 people, that's about the size of Lancet. If you adjust for population to get a sense of how severe an impact this was in Guatemala, it would be as if every person in Michigan was killed. All of California displaced. And then it begins, you begin to get a sense of how severe the consequences were. The UN Human Rights Commission declared it a genocide because it was Mayans, the indigenous, who were targeted to a large extent. The vast majority of victims were Mayans, people who were defined as other. Um, and so again, to talk a little bit about the consequences of otherness. One of the places we go in Guatemala that several of you have been, the Forensic Anthropological Foundation of Guatemala, the group this last January wasn't able to go there, unfortunately. Uh, but this is kind of what we see. They have bones laid out where they're exhuming mass graves and trying to connect um, the remains with the families. And in some cases, these are remains from 20 or 30 years ago, but the families have no idea what the final disposition of their loved one was. I mean, they're pretty sure by now they were killed, but they want to do a proper burial. Uh, and the other purpose, they're doing DNA analysis and they've testified in the recent genocide trial. Rios Montt, the dictator from 82 to 83, has been on trial for genocide. And so FAFG has played a role in that. I think those of you who've been there before, the two things that are most chilling to me, one is when you see a skeleton laid out for analysis, and it's this long. Uh, and it happens pretty frequently there. So a lot of children who were killed and some pretty horrific stories about how they were killed. The other part that's kind of chilling is the warehouse. Boxes and boxes and boxes of bones waiting to be analyzed. Uh, and so this is one of many, many genocides we could point to around the globe that are inspired by this sense of you are other, uh, and therefore a stranger, and therefore um, instead of pulling close, we'll push you away or kill you. Miroslav Wolf has a book called Exclusion and Embrace, where he talks about two different, what he calls epistemological postures. What's the study of epistemology? Someone who's taken philosophy should be able to tell me this. Okay, everybody has to take philosophy now. <laughs> uh, epistemology is the study of knowing, how we know. And so it's kind of interesting to talk about the epistemological postures in this context, but he talks about two different possible epistemological postures, open arms or the closed <coughs> fist. Uh, and open arms is someone who looks at the stranger, to use Georg Zimmel's examine, uh, um, concept, and say, this person I will pull close. I want to know more. I want to learn about them. The closed fist is a person who says, this person's a threat and I'm not sure about them, uh, they could be a threat, maybe a threat, uh, and so I will respond with a closed fist. So the question becomes, who can I exclude? Who must I embrace? That's the ethical question I want to pose in terms of the social obligations of what it means to be human. And in response to that, we get this really radical guy, Jesus. If you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, it starts with the lawyer seeking to justify himself. What does that mean, a lawyer seeking to justify himself? Basically saying, I want to know who I can exclude. Because Jesus had just told him, 
love your neighbor. He talks about the two commandments, and Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. He wants to know who he can count as the stranger. Not my neighbor, but the stranger. Who can I exclude? And Jesus responds by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. And basically in this, as you know the story, three good, devout Jews walk by and leave the stranger by the side of the road. It's the Samaritan that uh, offers to help him, even takes him somewhere and says, if it costs more, I will pay out of my own pocket for this person who I might view as my enemy. Jews and Samaritans weren't fond of each other, uh, and so forth. Um, and if you remember, when we talk about aliens and stranger, uh, in the Old Testament, there are several spots that talk about, you shall not oppress a stranger. The other term that's used in translation is an alien. And it goes on to say, because you yourselves were once aliens or strangers in the land of Egypt. Now the irony, if I go all the way back to the beginning of my personal journey in, in wrestling with otherness, when they're integrating my school through busing, when I look at the names of the people who are arrested for throwing eggs at the bus and so forth, they were all Italian names. The neighborhood I grew up in, about a third of the population were either Polish or Italian immigrants, smaller percentage of Greek immigrants, but first generation immigrants in the community. So it's not that long ago that they were the strangers. They were the other, they were the aliens, and they were discriminated against. Uh, but the, the principle here is you were all aliens at one point, so you shall not oppress the alien because you were once aliens yourselves. In Reza Oslin's recent book on Jesus, he, ta he talks about Jesus' statement that about loving your enemies, because that's where it gets most radical. It means, okay, the stranger, I'm not sure if he's my friend or my enemy, so maybe I can just love him. Home. But the enemy, the person I know is my enemy, how do I love him? In Reza Oslin's book, I think he makes a serious mistake. He says that Jesus couldn't possibly be talking about the Romans. He must be talking about other Jews who were their enemies because no typical Jew would say, love your enemies. Well, there's an important assumption he makes there. If we know anything about Jesus, it's that he wasn't a typical Jew. I mean, he was Jewish, yes, and so forth, but very atypical in many, many ways. And so I think he probably means, yes, even the Romans. Even loving the Romans becomes important. So, how can I embrace? That's the, the last kind of ethical question I want us to encounter. Um, Micah 6 8 is my signature passage on my email. What does God require of you? Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Donnell Dorr, a Jesuit priest, has a book called Spirituality and Justice where he talks about three conversions. What the first of those conversions is personal conversion. And he defines that a little bit differently than we do in evangelical circles. Uh, I was converted when I was five, twice when I was seven, once again when I was eight. Every time a new speak evangelist came to town, you know, up to the altar again, just to make sure the last time took. Uh, he means something more like walking humbly with your God. So that kind of conversion experience that evangelicals talk about could be a starting point, but it's not the end point. Conversion becomes a lifelong experience of walking humbly with our God. That's personal conversion. Moral conversion is when we move from seeing the other as it to thou. And I'll give one quick story about this. When we were living on Francis Street in Jackson, predominantly African American community, I had been teaching at the prison, and I get home from teaching at the prison, there's a tall African American man standing in my driveway. And he says, could you check your house and see if anything's missing? I think, well, that's an interesting way to start a conversation. <laughs> and I look, and the back window's been broken, and I go inside, and sure enough, there's a 13-inch color TV that's no longer there. And he said, I was afraid of that. I saw my son and two other boys with a television. I'll go get the television. You can call the police. Just having come back from the prison, I did not want to call the police. And so I, I, I talked to the man for a minute, once he came back with the TV, and I said, look, I have a TV now, what we still have is a broken window. And so if you want to send your son over tomorrow with some money for glass, I'll show him how to glaze the window, we'll fix it. And then everything that's broken is fixed. And it turns out um, the father was the Muslim imam, the chaplain of the prison. And out of that relationship, 
I next fall I hired his son to rake leaves for us and things like that. Could have responded with a closed fist, uh, but the open arms changed the nature of the relationship in pretty significant ways. And that became our security system in that neighborhood, by the way, because as word got out about how we related to the other, people looked out for us, and people cared for us in, in significant ways. Moral conversion then from I it to I thou. The other example I often give of this is one of the times I was in England with a group of students. And when we're in London in England, students have to file a flight plan. They have to either go to Old Bailey or House of Parliament. They have to go to the British Museum or somewhere another place. And I decided, because I teach criminology, I decided to go to Old Bailey, which is the criminal court. And so I just followed the crowd and kind of um, got into this trial and discovered that it's a rape murder trial that uh, a man had raped and murdered, was accused of having raped and murdered his former girlfriend. About 15 minutes into the trial, they cleared the courtroom to discuss a procedural point, and so we're all standing out in the lobby, and I'm looking around, trying to get a sense of who's who. And I start thinking about, I wonder which of these people is the father of the victim? Who's the mother of the accused? People I don't know, people who are strangers. But in that moment, I felt their pain regardless of who they were. And that's what Dora means by moral conversion, when we're willing to step into the suffering of others and let their suffering be our suffering. I never said a word to any of them, but I stayed and prayed, and that's the essence of moral conversion. What Dora means by systemic conversion is supporting systems and institutions that foster embrace. We have lots of political and other kinds of issues going on that could fall under this heading. When I saw the pictures of the unaccompanied minors arriving from Central America at the border and saw the contorted faces and the rage of the people who didn't want the kids here, I went back to 1968 and it looked just like the kids arriving at my school. And so whether it's immigration issues, other kinds of issues, I think the Church of Christ is called on to model that kind of profound love that goes beyond our natural inclink, uh, inclinations, for example, to kind of to tribalism or to identity politics or something like that. And so for me, that's the call. That's the social obligation of what it means to be human, to borrow a line from the movie Rent, uh, using it in a slightly different way. There's only us. In the larger scheme of things, there is no them. And that's part of our task is to understand what it means to say there's only us. Good. I was hoping we'd have some time for questions, so who wants to kick us off? Kick us out, <laughs> Yes? Paul, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, not at the, maybe the, with the detail of books and that you have so far, but I think the I did mindset comes out of fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wonder if somehow there's a way to I mean, I just think it's a growth process, but uh, how can we somehow address that? I think it's fair. It is, and I think it's probably, you know, it's, it's wired into us. We'll check with the person sitting next to you there. But the, the fight and flight kind of phenomenon is part of uh, our, can I use the term evolutionary here? Evolutionary inheritance that for protection and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's a natural instinct. But when we become so fearful, um, one of the things I was looking at in terms of timelines, about the same time they were integrating my school through busing, the My Lai massacre happened in Vietnam, uh, which had a lot to do with my decisions about Vietnam and the military and some things like that. But it was about 400 civilians killed because we weren't sure if these are potential enemies or not kind of thing. And the US military herded them into a ditch and opened fire. Um, and so part of it is, is risky uh, when we start encountering the other, we're not sure, but fear becomes a first reaction, but it doesn't have to be a last reaction. I think, I think that's what you mean by maturation. But just to tell you something I struggle with, I try to have compassion for fearful people. Yeah. I try to have compassion for that mindset, but I really have trouble having compassion for the people that feed fear yeah. for their own ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Other questions? or comments. Bueller? Bueller? It's a joke to you. 
<laughs> Anyone else? Or suggestions on how you think we can do embrace or issues that we think become part of this? I think something that's recently been bothering me a lot, um, you know, especially with the ascendance of whatever you call it, ISIS or you know, Islamic State, is that um, uh, Muslims are getting othered yes. because mm -hmm. of what this this group, you know, is doing as yeah. radical and as far out extremist as they are. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't help that their name is Islamic State, right? So right. right. That's something that's been um, been weighing on me, um, you know, because there are a lot of Muslims that I care for personally. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, when we bring our court under class to Chicago and yeah. we go to the mosque, um, you know, so yeah, I, you know, just part of me is 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 really worried for, you know, uh, our Muslim neighbors and what they're going through um, in the face of uh, more reasons for them to be stereotyped in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would hate to be, because I claim to be a Christian, hate to be identified with Fred Phelps, you know, uh, the late Fred Phelps, Westboro West Baptist Church, Church mm -hmm. God Hates Bags, that kind of thing. Uh, and so there are hateful elements of every religion and, and hateful people and things like that. And so. Part of the struggle is, so in social psych, we talk about cognitive schemata, that we have ways, we have file systems in our heads. Uh, and part of the problem is when we classify way too broadly, and there's one person that fits this category, and we start lumping all kinds of other people into that category. When I talk social psych, uh, I would make the statement that everybody's prejudiced. That's not the problem. The problem is when prejudice becomes discrimination. We, we have to prejudge to make sense of the world. If every cognitive stimulus we encountered was new and different, what we saw as new and different, we would go insane trying to make sense of the world. And so we do prejudge. But if that immediately goes to fear kind of thing, instead of processing it and saying, wait, does this really belong in this category? Do all people belong in this category? Uh, and so forth, then we're gonna have that kind of overgeneralization that will lead to discrimination and maybe lead to genocides and things like that. Other questions or comments? Yes, thank you. Well, I think it's interesting, like I, you mentioning the ISIS and like the effect that has, I grew up in Dearborn, which is extremely Muslim and grew up with friends and neighbors that I called family who are Muslim. Mm -hmm. I was interesting coming like into Spring Arbor and seeing that difference where the story I had seen my entire life was these are my friends and yeah, the people yeah. I love. And like the story other people have seen was what the news told. And I'm a film major, so it's interesting to see like the story you're told and how that affects, you know, you brought up like the movie and just how do you like, how do the stories we tell about people yeah. affect how we see them? Well, and, and part of it is, um, the beginning of being able to move to I Thou is entering the frame of the other. Uh, and that means taking to someone you don't understand to lunch. When I co-pastored this church in Jackson, Sunday afternoons we would have discussions about race relations. And it was a context in which everybody knew each other, we loved each other, and so we could ask stupid questions. I remember one time a white person said, what is CP time? I heard you people talking about CP time, and short for colored people's time. Uh, in Guatemala, we sometimes talk about Guatemala time. He's on Guatemala time or something. A different <laughs> sense, and it's, if you look at it from a different perspective, it could be that we're a little bit anal about time, or a little OCD. I mean, it depends on which side you're looking at. But we, we created a space in which we could have those conversations. And people could ask stupid questions, or what appeared to be stupid questions, without fear of being you know, politically incorrect, or uh, and with a sense of trust that the question was coming from a good place, uh, from a desire to understand, not to critique, not to criticize. And so whatever the issue is, whatever the other is, if you can sit, find somebody that you can talk to, 
and say, can I better understand your world? Uh, can you help me understand where you're coming from and who you are? And that is the beginning of moving from that kind of I, it, to something closer to a real I, thou relationship. And I think, I think that's the call of Christ for Christians. Yeah, right. You'll understand where I'm trying to go, even though I don't articulate well in the question. Okay. Um, <laughs> I prob- I'll try to match the level of articulateness <laughs> in my answer. <laughs> Paul knows me well, so we yes. can fill in between the lines. Um, to your comment about the comparison of the individual in Florida and the Muslims and the, the tendency to corral and frame people and generalize and that kind of thing. And it, it leads to us potentially can lead to a sense that if, if we make those comparisons and say that, well, let me go to um, Obama's comments at the prayer meeting about yeah. uh, the Crusades and Christians and Muslims and that kind of thing. That can lead to a position where we're afraid to say that there's anything of, in the way of absolute truth. That, that it's, well, they're entitled to their perspective, it's not representative, it's et cetera, et cetera. And get away from what is, finding what is true and then responding to that in the sense of, yes, we can say as Christ followers that yeah. we have truth. And, and then how we react accordingly to others that are not Christians in, in our sense of what we believe is is right and what is wrong. Yeah, I yeah, boy, I think I'll be able to match. Actually, I won't be able to match how articulate you were because <laughs> the answer is a lot more complex than that. Yeah, I, and I think, oh, um, I don't think Obama was responding to the right or wrongness of the actions, but simply a posture of self righteousness. Does that make sense? That uh, we have to confront the fact that we have even, I don't think he brought up the near genocide we had in the Americas uh, and things like that, but there are other things. That, and we can talk about the extent to which it's a false equivalency and so forth. It's a different kind. Um, one of my the, uh, beloved theology profs here at Spring Arbor used to say, every conception of God is a misconception. That is, God is so far beyond our ability to know that uh, there are things I believe are true and I'm willing to stake my life on them, but I still have to s- articulate with a sense of humility. Does, does that make sense in responding? And so, yes, I affirm this, I believe this, and so forth, but when it becomes, whether it's us or them, uh, when it gets to the point where we are ready to go to war and take you out because you don't agree with us, either way, uh, I, I think we err at that point. And I think I probably didn't come anywhere near your level of articulateness in responding to that. But um, uh, other other thoughts or comments on that? I think I think we need to speak the truth that we have in love. Yeah. And and that yeah. is part of the secret of avoiding the conflict of the other. I know I'm cross cultural where we have to have opportunity for interfaith dialogue with uh, Buddhist monks or with. Um, Islam online um, in Egypt, um, young people coming together with respect for one another to try to understand one another. Right. And, and, and when I when yeah. when I've been a part of those dialogues, um, I, I just remember one of our workers in Myanmar, not cross cultural, but in the church, um, asked when in a disaster zone in Myanmar after the typhoon went to the Buddhist Wat to ask permission of the monks there to bring in food, fishing nets, clothing, and the gospel of John. And they've never heard of Jesus. Mm. And he said, we've never heard of Jesus. Tell us about him. And I think of the Buddhist monks as as spiritual <coughs> seekers. Yeah. And, and a lot of times imams and all that, they're spiritual seekers. They just don't have the truth that we by God's grace, have been given, mm-hmm. and um, and just a, a good conversation of understanding one another is a step in the right direction. Yeah, well, and I think uh, to underscore your point and 
Dr. Chia's point, uh, I've taken students to that same mosque. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, it wasn't a Spring Arbor group. It was a group before ours that started the conversation with, doesn't it bother you that you're going to hell? And, and I'm not sure that's the best way to start the conversation or to get to understanding and some of that kind of stuff. Now, we may believe that, but that's not the way to initiate a conversation. So part of it is about tone and it's about maybe our goal. Uh, is it just about convincing them that we're right or is it trying to get to some kind of mutual understanding where they understand our worldview, we understand theirs? Other questions or comments? Yeah. Here. How would our world look if we all embraced? What what would be different? A lot. Yeah. There'd be a lot more people on the planet for one thing. Uh, <laughs> just in terms of the genocides and the wars and things like that. But uh, it, in my times when I've been able to sit with someone, one short example, when I worked at the prison, uh, I would play chess with one of my clerks, Bob. Uh, Bob was on his fifth bid in prison, five different times he'd been in prison, 11 male members of his family, all of them had done a bit in prison. And he, he beat me severely in chess every time we played, and after about 10 games he told me that he was the, the champion of Jackson Prison and our junior grandmaster, so I was severely outclassed. But the best part was the conversations we had. And he's African American from inner city of Detroit, low income family, all that goes with that. He said, Paul, where you grew up, sooner or later you go on to college. Where I grew up, sooner or later you do a bit. And he's basically saying, we come from two different worlds. And we could have conversations about those two different worlds. And we could, but it only comes when there's that sense of trust that goes. One other much less extre extreme example that I, s I still think of, um, I love to engage cab drivers in conversation. Uh, and, and often cabbies are the people, you know, just take me here and leave me alone kind of thing. My wife and daughter were in the back seat. We were in Washington, D.C., and we were there over Thanksgiving, staying at a timeshare, and I was going to cook Thanksgiving dinner the next day. So the cabbie and I, as we're driving along, he's going to cook dinner. I asked him if he has to work on Thanksgiving and no, and what's he going to cook for Thanksgiving, and I'm cooking for Thanksgiving. We're comparing recipes and all kinds of stuff. And we get to the hotel, and I pay him to get out. He comes around and shakes my hand. And it's just that simple that he was no longer an it. Uh, he was no longer just the guy who's going to get me from point A to point B. We've had a conversation, and we related as human beings. Uh, and yeah, I think because cab drivers often just treat it as it's in that sense, that makes a difference. That changes the dynamic and humanizes it, I think. It's some, so sometimes it's just small things and how we react to the other thing. Paul, oh, isn't it maybe important to recognize that Every encounter doesn't go that like that. Oh yeah. And uh, I mean, I remember we took a cross-cultural group to uh, visit an imam in South Africa. Yeah. And there was a point in the conversation where you know I thought we were actually you know we were having a pretty polite dialogue, and there was a conversation. There was a comment that the person made about well you know, uh, and this was at a time not after not long after 9/11 and so forth. He said well you know I really think Osama bin Laden is a pretty reasonable guy. Okay. And yeah. at that point, our ability to converse kind of fell yeah, yeah, off yeah. pretty precipitously. Yeah, know? yeah. And not every encounter is able to go to that level of. of, of uh, I had more than up. one encounter in the prison that uh, I had one inmate that met me for the first time and started by, I think it started with Honky Mofo or something like that. And it just <laughs> went downhill from there, swore at me for about five minutes straight, and I decided to respond by saying, well, I hadn't realized we met before, uh, to try and diffuse the situation. But he had a whole lot of anger that took us about a year to get through. But we did. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot. And sometimes you never will. I mean, sometimes the bitterness, the anger, the hostility is such. Uh, my spiritual director once told me, beneath all anger is a profound sadness. And I think if in the other you can get beneath the anger to talk about the sadness, then there's hope. But as long as it's just the anger that we're responding to, it's, it's hard to have any kind of reasoned discourse. Dr. Wolba. Uh, question comment, uh, and I have to say, before I even start, I don't, I don't like the idea of myself. Um, but this is something that I'm just coming back, and I try to keep it at 
data sometimes as we were talking about, for example, you can cut it again. Uh, so you, you can tell me what you think. Uh, is there a sense in which this uh, embrace concept open up incarnation what we found the world will that ultimately we'll have to recognize at some point it may be leading to the person trying to pursue those uh, things and apply them Yes. That at some point, um, what we found with that could be also um, the Philippians too. Yeah. To the point of death. I think so. And that maybe this is what it takes. Yes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when Jesus calls a man, he calls him to come and die. And and I think that's that is the radicalness of the gospel, and why it seems so profoundly impractical. Points, but I, I do think that is the potential. I, I, yes, and I can think of many cases where that is that um, Oscar Romero is apparently on his way to canonization by the Catholic Church, and uh, Stanley Gother in Guatemala that some of you visited the shrine did in fact pay the ultimate price. How do you see the, uh, the fight against? In that context, where's the victory? Where's the victory? I mean, someone would say that, well, if I'm going to be uh, trying to do this and eventually lose my life in it, and then what's the point? Often, as Christians, I have been thinking in terms of how to fight this and yet try to protect and preserve our life, which is not bad at all. I just right. I don't like the idea of I'm in favor of life. I'm one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering that uh, this part of In my classes, when I would talk about the fact that Jesus, um, we get into discussions about was Jesus political or not. And I think a lot of Jesus' actions were critique of Rome and some things like that. My students will say, well, if it's Jesus against Rome, then Rome won because they crucified him. And I say, okay, where's the Roman Empire today? And where's the kingdom of God today? And if you want, I think, Jesus' statement, if someone wants to find their life, they must be willing to lose it. And I, I do think sometimes it is, in fact, the ultimate price. And it's back to Dr. Brown's point about fear that makes us want to make sure we never have to pay that ultimate price kind of thing. Thank you so much. We're out of time.